Today I'm going to tell you the story of Donald Nielsen. Donald was born in 1936 in Bradford in England. He died on the 18th of December 2011 and he was age 75. He was known as the Black Panther. His criminal penalty was that he was in life imprisonment and his crimes took place between 1971 and 1975. He killed a total of four people. In this podcast, I'll tell you about his early life, then I'll tell you about the crimes. So if you do end up liking this video, or if you listen to it on Spotify, please subscribe and follow. I'm going to read some newspaper articles that I found regarding Mr. Nielsen. Now, he was born Donald Nappy. He was aged 10 in January 47, when his 33-year-old mother, died from breast cancer. He was said to have had an unhappy childhood and was caught shop breaking in 1948. But due to his age and circumstances, he was given a police caution and a stern warning. He married 20-year-old Irene Tate in April 1955 at the age of 18. His wife persuaded him to leave the army where he was serving as a national serviceman in the King's own Yorkshire Light Infantry. Their daughter, Catherine, was born in 1960. Four years after his daughter's birth, Nappy changed the family name to Nielsen so that the little girl would not suffer the bullying and abuse that he endured at school and in the army because of his surname's similarity to the word Nappy. And for those that don't know, in the United Kingdom, Nappy is the word we say for diaper. Now, Nappy bought a taxi business from a man named Nielsen and decided to use that name instead of the former. An alternative theory proposed by a lodger, Lena Fernley, who stayed with the Nielsen family in the early 1960s, is that Nielsen took the name from an ice cream van from which he and Irene often bought ice cream for their daughter. Eventually, the family settled in Bradford while Donald tried various jobs mainly around the building trade. So we begin in 1965. He was not happy with his income. So he branched out into house burglary, which was his first real venture into crime. It is estimated that he committed hundreds of house burglaries, but Nielsen was still not happy with his income. He progressed to armed post office robbery in the years between 1967 and 1972 he committed at least 19 robberies. In 1972, the first sign of violence, as Nielsen, wearing his now trademark black balaclava, shot and wounded a Lancashire sub-postmaster. Luckily, the injuries were not life-threatening. On the 15th of February, 1974, he shot and killed sub-postmaster Donald Skepper at his New Park post office in Harrogate, North Yorkshire. 6th of September 1974, Nielsen murdered Derek Astin in Accrington at the higher Baxenden post office. On the 11th of November 1974, he murdered Sidney James Grayland at the sub post office in Langley, West Midlands, and he also violently beat Miss Grayland, leaving her for dead. On the 14th of January 1975, the Whittle family was subjected to a particularly horrifying ordeal that would stay with them for a long time. On Mrs. Whittle's arrival at the house at 12.45 a.m., she found her daughter, Leslie Whittle, asleep in bed. She took her usual sleeping tablet and slept heavily, waking up at 7 a.m. and making breakfast for Leslie. She was surprised to find that Leslie was not in bed, and the clothes that she was to wear that day were still neatly folded on the chair. In panic, she then picked up the telephone to ring Leslie's brother, Ronald. The telephone was dead. She rushed in her dressing gown to the car to find the door was open from the lounge to the garage. This door was really used and was supposed to be locked. After her arrival at Ronald's home, Ronald and his wife Gaynor accompanied Mrs. Whittle back to the house. There they found a box of Turkish delight on the hearth rug in front of the fireplace with a ransom demand of £50,000 and giving instructions for someone from the family to be at a telephone box the next day to receive instructions on passing the money. The message also said that if police were involved, then death was the outcome. It was then clear 
that Leslie had been abducted from her house when she was in bed and only her robe and slippers were missing. Ron Whittle called the police and reported all the details. The police made arrangements for the telephone call to be monitored. On the 16th of January 1975, 16th of January is my birthday by the way, when the telephone call came at 11.30pm, the call was a taped message spoken by Leslie. The message said that she was alright and that someone from her family was to go to the telephone box in Kids Grove to retrieve a message that was behind the backboard of the kiosk. Her voice was verified by Ron Whittle and the police then made arrangements for a radio link to be established with a spider's web of police assistance discreetly across the area Ron was assured that if he was in need of help then it could be with him in under two minutes. All this arranging took two hours and Ron Whittle left Bridge North Police Station at 1.30am to drive to Kidsgrove. He took a wrong turn in the dark and eventually arrived at Kidsgrove Post Office telephone box. After looking for 30 minutes, he found a message that told him to go to Bathpool Park, which is situated about one and a half miles away. The message instructed him to go to the top of the lane and turn into no entry, go to the wall and flashlights, look for the torchlight run and then wait for further instructions on the torch. Ron arrived at Bathpool Park and turned into the no entry as instructed. But in the dark, he did not see the low wall that edged the railway bridge and drove to the end of the lane. He stopped, flashed his lights, got out of the car and shouted and there was no one there. Ron left the park and met up again with the police. 7th of February 1975, the police discreetly searched the park. There was nothing found. 10th of February 1975, the news blackout was lifted. On the 2nd of March 1975, a television interview was staged with Ron Whittle and the police. Ron had to mention his trip to Bathpool Park on TV and the police needed to act as if they did not know about this so that they could stage a full search of the area. After this interview, a Kids Grove headmaster contacted police with a few plastic Dymo tape labels two of his pupils had found in the park. One said, drop suitcase into hole. The next development was a couple of schoolboys finding a tort wedged in the grills of what was locally known as the glory hole. This was one of the capped ventilation shafts of the old Hare Castle tunnel. The boys said that a plastic label was attached to the torch which they peeled off but they said that they never read it. On Thursday the 6th of March 1975, an urgent search of the park was instructed, starting with the glory hole. A detective constable went into the shaft and found a dymo machine and a roll of tape and not much else. The second shaft was then checked and nothing was found. The third shaft, the deepest of the three near to the park entrance that was once a shaft to Nelson's coal mine was then uncapped. Friday the 7th of March 1975, Nelson's coal mine shaft was uncapped. It showed a vertical ladder at the side and a landing 22 feet down the shaft. On his first landing was found a broken torch. This had been dropped down the shaft by police when lifting the cap. There was then a second landing approximately 45 feet down from the surface. On this landing, there was a tape recorder. There was then seen a third landing, approximately 54 feet below the surface. On this landing was a rolled up sleeping bag against the bottom of the ladder to act as a pillow, a yellow foam mattress and a survival blanket. Then Leslie's body was seen hanging from the landing, suspended by a steel wire around her neck. Her feet were only 7 inches from the floor. Inspection of the floor of the shaft, approximately a further 7 feet below the third landing, was a number of items. There were strips of used elastoplasts, 3 inches wide. One had some of Leslie's eyebrow hairs attached to it and had been used as a blindfold. There were some brown trainers, size 7, more dyno tape, a cassette tape, microphone and lead. Leslie's slippers, a thermos flask, blue core trousers and a reporter's notepad. In all these things, there was only one partial fingerprint and that was on the notepad. 
after four months of every other fingerprint investigation being put practically on hold, no match could be found to this print. On the 11th of December 1975, two policemen in their car in Mansfield saw a man rushing past and seemed to be hiding his face. They got out of their car as routine and asked the man his name and where he was going. The man replied he was John Moxon and then pulled a gun out of his coat and told the two policemen he wanted them to take him to a nearby village of Blindworth. When they got to Blidworth, one of the policemen managed to distract the gunman long enough to move the barrel from his partner's side and the gun was fired, tearing a hole in the roof of the car and throwing shrapnel all over the driver. The car was stopped outside the local fish and chip shop where it took both policemen and the customers from the shop and a large miner to capture this wiry little man and put him in handcuffs. It was said that he fought like a wild animal and was so strong that it was near impossible to hold him. Back at the police station, John Moxon was searched and was found to be carrying a duplicate of each thing he carried. He had two watches on one strap that were perfectly synchronized, two torches and two sets of batteries, two knives, two razor blades and two pairs of gloves. As a matter of routine, his fingerprints were taken before he was locked in a cell. They were checked with one from the shaft at Bathpool and it was a match. John Moxon was not very cooperative at interviews, sometimes taking as long as 15 minutes before answering a question. He was asked why this was so and replied that he was thinking. It took a long time before he gave his correct name and address saying that he didn't want his wife and daughter involved. He didn't want to embarrass them in any way. When he knew he was going to be in the newspapers and everyone would know, then he gave his real name, Donald Nielsen. His home was searched and an obsessive amount of firearms and weaponry was found. His life was found to be obsessive on the military. He took his wife and daughter on maneuvers and staged fake battles. There were links and clues to other crimes he had committed, as well as to the murder of Leslie Whittle. Nielsen has always claimed that he did not intend to kill Leslie and that she slipped. He also claimed that all the post office shootings were accidents. On the 4th of June 1976, Donald Nielsen's trial started. He was charged with the following. Abduction of Leslie Whittle, making a demand of £50,000 and threat to kill Leslie Whittle, the murder of Leslie Whittle, burglary and stealing firearms in Dewsbury, burglary and stealing firearms at Cheadle Hume, murder of Donald Lawson Skepper in Harrogate at New Park Post Office, murder of Derek Astin in Accrington, murder of Sidney James Grayland in Langley, attempted murder of Margaret Grayland, grievous bodily harm to Margaret Grayland, attempting to murder PC Stuart McKenzie, possession of two shotguns with intent to endanger life, attempted murder of Gerald Arthur Smith, Eventually, he was found guilty and sentenced to five life sentences. On the 29th of June 2008, it was confirmed by prison service that Nielsen had developed motor neuron disease. On Saturday, the 17th of December 2011, Nielsen is taken from Norwich Prison to hospital. And a day later, on Sunday the 18th, Donald Nielsen dies of breathing difficulties at 6.45pm in Norwich Hospital. Now I go back in this case, I go back to his initial bullying as a kid. Do you remember when he saw when he commits a crime, he then sees the police. And instead of just talking to the police normally and walking away, giving them a fake name, he starts to act all suspicious. And I think there's two reasons for this. Number one, obviously he's worried, he's nervous, they found him, and he was not composed in that moment. But I also think number two, with all the bullying he got as a child, and being abandoned by his parents as a child, anyone that ever came up to him, stepped to him, questioned him, I think he retaliated aggressively because all he ever got was criticism his whole life. So the police come up to him and say, hey, what are you doing? And in his mind, he's thinking, what do you mean? What am I doing? Who are you? Who are you to question me? You understand? Whereas, generally speaking, a normal person, when approached by the police, will just answer questions. I've done it many times. Whenever I see police officers on the street, which doesn't happen often, very rarely, but you know, hi officer, how are you? You know, just normal goodwill, right? So I think Donald suffered from little man complex, where he tried to overcompensate for his inner insecurities. The income and the ransom make sense. I'm, I'm not saying make sense as in it's a justified crime, 
but he's poor he wants more money so in a crime he demands money you can see the link right i don't understand why he killed everyone else maybe he was just angry and as i said with a little man complex you take everything as a competition and you try to overcome and defeat everyone because you've been marginalized for most of your life of course it's unfortunate but it's highly immature and may all the victims rest in peace and this is just a long line of crazy murderers who were given a whole life tariff thank you for listening